Good morning everybody and welcome to my channel. I'm so happy that you stopped by. Uh, leave a like and please subscribe. It does help my channel out quite a bit. I'm sorry for the glare on my glasses. Um, it's early, early morning here. Well, not that early. I've been up a lot earlier. <laughs> but uh, for some reason I'm getting so much glare on my glasses. And I've tried every which way to stop it. I guess I'm going to have to break down and get one of those uh, desktop lights that are round or whatever. And um, it's just, it, it bothers me. The glare bothers me terrible. But I can't help that. And you know, I've done everything I can. Uh, going on my third month of, of doing uh, YouTube videos. So maybe in another three months I'll have everything organized. We'll, we'll think about it, won't we? <laughs> the Democratic Party and their media allies are in overdrive to convince the American public that the obviously psychotic attacker of Paul Pelosi was a right-wing ultra-maga operative. Blame it on the right wing. Never mind that the racial nudists claim to see invisible fairies lived in a hippie commune it is of utmost importance that he be tied to January 6th and supporters of former President Donald Trump. Now, why is that of the utmost importance? Was he there that day? Is there pictures of him being there that day? You know, there's a lot of questions that we all have. A lot of questions. But let's just go ahead and blame poor little Trump. You know, well, he's not very little. He's a big, tall man. But <laughs> bless his heart, he's sure been through the mill. But he's the best president, I tell you what, that we ever had. In my day. You know, in my day. It is hardly surprising that this is the narrative pushed by the left just days before they are expected to be roasted in the midterm elections. In the words of the former Secretary of State and failed presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, the GOP and its supporters spread hate and deranged conspiracy theories. This from the same person who blames everything, apparently including the despicable attack on Paul Pelosi, on a vast right-wing conspiracy. She adds that violence is a result and we must hold them accountable for their words in the action that follows. Where was Clinton when an armed leftist flew across the country and attempted to assassinate Justice Brent Kavanaugh? Or when BLM radicals burned police stations? Or when pro-abortionists torched faith-based pregnancy centers and vandalized churches? A lot of questions. Never be left out, President Joe Biden cast blame on election deniers. And his press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, oh, I love saying that word, Frenchie, eh? <laughs> appeared, on, <laughs> appeared on MSNBC Sunday to throw her weight behind blaming conservatives for the assault. Comparing the San Francisco incident to January 6th, she declared that we need to end this type of rhetoric. The truth of David de Pape and the attack on the Pelosi residence was quickly revealed, but does not fit the narrative that Democrats want to spread before the midterm elections. From none other than his ex-life partner and mother of his two sons, the judgment is that the illegal attacker had been mentally ill for a long time. I stated that before. You know, why was he even free? Why was he walking the streets? I mean, good gravy. Oxane Taube, T-A-U-B, Taub, O-X-A-N-E, T-A-U-B, Oxane Taub, who is serving time in California on charges involving a 14-year-old, detailed the long history of bizarre behavior by the suspect. She described DePape returning from a nearly year-long disappearance, believing he was Jesus. Oh, my. God. The suspect is being held on charges of attempted homicide, assault with a deadly weapon, elderly abuse, 
and other felonies. Paul Plosey is expected to make a full recovery and thank God for that. Thank heavens for that. That is some good news. That could have turned out so much worse. Oh my goodness. So much worse. Thank heavens for the Lord Jesus looking out for him. He's lucky. Very lucky. Yeah. Let's see what this one is here. I got a line up here again. <laughs> I worked on it yesterday in between times of doing everything else I do. Well, a week out, here are 2022's most vulnerable House and Senate members. Now, this is published in Political News. I always try to look for, um, so I don't get in trouble with, uh, uh, oh, what do you call that? Copyrights. Yeah. Uh, so I have found a lot of news articles that at the bottom they have stated this copyrighted. You know, that helps us a lot, us YouTubers, that they would put that on their news so we don't get in trouble doing something we're not supposed to do by the rules. You know, so I sure appreciate that. If anybody is listening that would contribute to that, you know, um, I really do appreciate that. And I'm sure the rest of the YouTubers do too, you know. All right, a week before Election Day, the list of the 10 most vulnerable House members includes a few new faces, while those on the Senate list remain the same, just in order. Both lists reflect the political climate, which has swung back to favor the Republicans following Democratic surge this summer after the party seized on abortion issues in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The economic issues on which Republicans have focused for much of the year seem to be re resonating with voters. Both parties have also tried to tie opposing candidates to the party's leaders. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump, many races remain close, and members of both parties are vulnerable, especially after redistricting made some districts more difficult for members. Redistricting, okay, for some districts. Districts more difficult for members. Boy, sometimes the way they word this stuff. Let me spread that out a little bit more. Three House members on CQ roll call September list have since fallen off. Democratic reps Mary Pitola of Alaska and Elisa Sklotkin, S-L-O-T-K-I-N, of Michigan, and GOP Representative Mike Garcia of California are still in competitive races. But they appear less vulnerable than Republican Yvette Harrell, H-E-R-R-E-L-L, -L, Harrell, of, North, of New Mexico, and Democrats Angie Craig of Minnesota, Susan Wild of Pennsylvania, who joined the list. Petola, who won a special election in August using the state's new ranked choice voting system, seems in better shape after one of her Republican opponents on next week's ballot, former Governor Sarah Palin, said she would rank Petola after herself and before Republican Nick Begich. B-E-G-I-C-H Begich. Slotkin, who faces a tough challenge from State Senator Tom Barrett, is still vulnerable, but appears slightly better positioned than some of her colleagues. Democrat Christy Smith is running against Garcia for the third time. This time they are competing in the 27th district. Biden would have won the district by 12.4 .4 points. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee has not disclosed outside spending in the district as of Monday. That's 12.4 12 point, 12 point points. Okay. Biden would have won the district. Like those three, many other members are vulnerable this cycle and could lose next week. The list does not include races in two districts, 
in which incumbents are facing each other. Florida Democrat Representative Al Lawson is running in the 2nd District against GOP Rep. Neil Dunn after Lawson's current district was initially drawn out of the state's congregational map. Dunn is favored to win. GOP Rep. Mayra Flores, who won a special election this year in Texas, 34 District, is facing Democrat Rep. Vincent Gonzalez. Vinci V-I-C-E-N-T-E, -E, Vinci Gonzalez, who was elected in the 15th district in 2020. Uh, Gonzalez is favored to win the redrawn district, which Biden would have won by 15.5 points in 2020. But both parties have spent heavily there. Republicans who need a net gain of five seats to win a House majority could also find success with just open seats, for which there are more than two dozen competitive races not included on this list. On the Senate side, the list has stayed notably statistic throughout the cycle. The top half of the list includes five incumbents, in, incumbents, incumbents, Bents, oh, incumbents, whose races are competitive, will help decide which party controls the Senate next year. Georgia Senator uh, Raphael Warnock moves back to number two spot, as that race appears tighter than Senator Ron Johnson's contest in Wisconsin. Okay, the second half of the list, starting with Utah Senator Mike Lee, includes incumbents who are less likely to lose but are vulnerable because of certain dynamics in their races. Take Lee, who is running against Evan McCullen, McMullen, M-E-C-U-M-C-M-U-L-L-I-N, -E uh, -E Evan McMullen, an independent and former long-shot GOP presidential candidate in a race that doesn't include a dramatic candidate, Democratic candidate. Lee is still favored to win, but the polls have tightened. You know, you try to pronounce these names and read these articles and stuff, and my throat tightens. <laughs> polls have tightened while my throat has tightened. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> okay, folks. Oh, golly sakes. I'm going to get some more lined up. God love you. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, this is a party, let me tell you. Okay, you are a blessing. And don't forget it. And I'm going to find my little camera button here. Okay, and I'll be back. Bye. So long. I don't like saying goodbye. So long and I'll see you in a bit.